Uh, please welcome the writer and director, Alex Ross Perry. And we also have... We'll save a seat for Jason. He's, he's in the bathroom. Okay. I'll put this uh, for him. Josephine Delabaume, one of the film's actresses. The cinematographer, Sean Price Williams. And the editor, Robert Green. Thanks everyone for hanging out. Thank you. This, this is, is by far like the most exciting. I'm so happy that the movie can finally be seen by New York audiences. It's like the final test of whether or not it actually is what it was supposed to be for me. So it's very exciting for us, these guys who see a lot of movies here. Good, and this was the first film we invited to the festival this year, so it's nice to finally have awesome. you all here. Uh, it's, <clears throat> it's been, from the time that we were invited to now, is almost double the length of time from when we started shooting to when we were invited. So, <laughs> because the movie's been, you know, it was so fast how we made it, but that's, I didn't know that actually. I'm going to start with a question for you, um, which I was hoping to also direct to Jason, but we can repeat it when he comes. Uh, the most obvious way to read this film is um, to think of Philip as an alter ego for you. Uh, could you t talk about that, or possibly? Oh, there he is. Ah, here he is. Um, but you can start talking. Jason Schwartzman, joining us. Um, yeah, I think that you know, like. So the question was whether Philip's an alter ego for me. Um, Sorry. I think like it, it's easy for people to assume that you know a guy my age makes a movie with a character this age, and there's some sort of similarity there, and there is to a small extent. But I, I do feel like Ike, Philip, and Ashley each have an equal part of like what I wanted to kind of split about my own questions that I had, and he has no more than either of the other ones. Um, in fact, you know, I would say that he has slightly less than. Than some of the than some of those other the, the the attributes that I gave to the other two characters. Could you maybe the both of you could talk a little bit about um, shaping this character, writing him and playing him? Uh, he's complicated to say the least. Um, he's uh, very uh, some of the things he does are pretty reprehensible. Um, but he's also uh, in moments uh, likable, sympathetic. In other moments, not so much. Um, the film also shifts perspectives. Um, you know, its distance, its position towards Phillips is constantly changing, and uh, is, as is the viewers. Could you maybe both talk a bit about that? Um, you know, the important thing, you know, I can answer that pretty briefly, is like, I just was interested in doing the movie that looks at the way that a character's behavior affects other people. Like it, it's one thing to do the movie about a character's behavior, to do a, a real character study. And to me, the sort of other approach to that is about what happens when that guy leaves the room. And it's just an idea that I'm really interested in. And I found it to be kind of an easy entry point to looking at the effects that a sort of, I won't say unlikable, but you know, like a challenging, complex, very conflicted uh, young man has on, two different people, a young woman and an older man. Um, kind of like the other movie that blew my mind, or I won't say other because that implies that my own movie blew my mind, but you know, um, you know, like a movie that approaches that same question to me of do people's lives continue to exist when you l walk away from them was Holy Motors, which like repeatedly asks the question of like when you walk into a room and something starts happening, is that when you leave, what keeps happening? And Phillip's a guy, who when he leaves the room, he doesn't think that like Ashley's life continues. So I wanted the movie to sort of combat what he thinks and be like, no, like the girlfriend he you leave behind has an entire horrible couple of months ahead of her. And yeah, it's nice to meet your heroes, but what happens to them when you go on to all the things that they inspired in you? Yes, uh, well, I, we really did all the character work together, Alex and I came to New York a, mo a month, sorry, that was my fault, uh, came to New York a month before we started shooting and Alex was so generous with his time, uh, he worked with me every day and we, uh, we watched movies and uh, specifically We Won't Grow Old Together, um, which uh, I think was a big in influence on, on the movie but especially um, on just uh, certain philosophies about 
having a, a movie centered around people that w were not treating each other well and were mishandling situations. Um, it was kind of an ex a really great example of, of, of a movie that uh, is, in, it is in a similar realm. And, um, you know, I think that when we first got together, we talked about should we, uh, how abrasive can this guy be? I mean, how uh, far into the red on uh, the meter do we go and uh, uh, how long can you sustain that in a movie? And it w we just experimented and talked about it and um, ate a lot of ice cream. And uh, I think that, um, I think the trick, I guess, to, to really doing it I, was just to be direct with this person. That that's something that's nice about him is that he's very direct, that you know at all times where you stand with him. I think a sub-level of this type of behavior is passive ag aggression. And so he's sort of like, um, I was likening him to um, vodka or gin, which uh, is higher alcohol content. But you know where you are when you're drinking it, whereas other people, um, it's red wine or champagne, something that tastes more delicious and you think you're and it, it catches up with you, and it's a very misleading um, experience. Uh, so that's what, uh, just as long as Philip was direct, was sort of the main, the main thing um, that Alex impressed upon me. Uh, since Josephine is here, I was hoping, Alex, maybe you could both talk a little bit about this um, constellation of uh, supporting characters in the film. Um, you've, obviously, you've structured this film around two larger-than-life um, men uh, with big egos, but you've also, uh, I think there's a lot of very, women you, uh, women characters, um, they don't necessarily have a whole lot of screen time, but they are actually, f I think, very fully imagined uh, characters. Sure, well, Josephine can be the sole representative of the female voice uh, on behalf of all the characters, but it was important to me that, you know, like simply put, Philip and Ike don't change, all three women do, and that the movie's not at all about men beating down women, but in fact is about three smart, capable, emotionally in control women who are not permanently damaged by Philip or Ike. And the only moments that are like sort of, to me, <clears throat> a little bit hopeful are the ways that all the women at some point take a stand. And that was just an important thing to keep in mind, you know, when crafting the movie's endorsement of the character's behavior because they all put up with it for a time, which I think is sort of what I wanted the movie to have to say about what people can get away with. is like anyone can get away with anything for a period of time. And it seems like, you know, Melanie's put up with her father's antics for a very long time. Ashley's put up with Philip for a little, for a few years, and Yvette puts up with him for like a couple of months. And then that's it. And then at some point, these men uh, push the women away, and then the women realize, like, what am I doing? Why am I wasting my time with a guy like this? Yeah, I mean, you said it very well. I think they all are quite charismatic women, and they would challenge him. And unfortunately, um, he's such a hateable character. I'm sorry. <laughs> you usually play quite lovable character, but this time, not really. But somehow, we've all met one person like that that you would kind of do anything for them and, and really go out of your way, even though they make you miserable. And, um, and it's kind of an interesting study of it. And yeah, and those women are not weak. They're all three of them quite strong. And somehow it still, you know, wins them over. And, and yeah, that's it. Uh, before opening up, I'd, l I'd like to bring uh, Sean and Robert into the discussion. Um, I want to point out too that Sean uh, was a cinematographer of another film in the festival's main slate, Josh and Benny Safdie's Heaven Knows What. Sorry. Oh, sorry, Iris as well. Um, that was in the documentary section showing tonight. As we all know, documentaries aren't the same as real movies. Oh, sorry, yeah. So. <laughs> great, great point. Okay, um, could you, maybe, could the three of you talk a little bit about your um, working process? Alex, you were alluding to how quickly this film uh, came together. I know you were shooting this time last year, actually. Yeah, we wrapped a year ago yesterday, and, and I missed most of the festival, which was a real shame for me as someone who's enjoyed it every year I've lived in New York. Um, but you've just wrapped another film, which uh, Sean shot, and which you're editing right now with Robert. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about well, your yeah, I mean, collaborations? 
you know, it might seem kind of silly. I don't know how many of these other press conferences have like DPs and editors up there, but it's really important for me because I do feel like the sort of filmmaking family that has grown, this is my third movie, has grown, you know, over the years is really something that I take very seriously and it's a certain level of like personal and creative loyalty that I find very fruitful. Um, I can't see Sean behind Josephine, but I imagine he's rolling his eyes. <laughs> but you know, like Sean and I worked together at Kim's video and Robert worked there before I did. Um, and you know, like, I've mostly, I mean for 10 years almost now, Sean and I just go to the movies and we've probably seen 150 movies in this room together. So having this sort of relationship where on our third movie and now a fourth one that we just wrapped, the shorthand is so concise and so complete to getting images. And you know, I've never, on the first two we couldn't afford a monitor. On this one we had a monitor that I never looked at. I was right next to him because I wanted to watch the actors and I don't need to look at the monitor to trust that we're getting what we want. And now editing a second movie with Robert, it's like we're editing faster than we were last year because like again, you just sort of pick up these little ticks. And I've known, I realized I actually met Robert in this theater when we saw Wiseman's Boxing Gym at the festival like however many years ago. Um, so you know, it's just it's just easier to have this shorthand, and it's really fun to sort of like just make movies with your friends, and then on this one, open it up to, you know, professional actors, but still basically make the same movie with the same people. Go ahead, Sean. Speak. Um, yeah, well, yeah, the Kim's video thing. That's uh, that was pretty critical, I guess, to our friendship, but also like um, going to the movies. Well, I don't know. Well, we we kind of came from documentary more originally, uh, I guess, not by choice though, <laughs> it just because it was just happening here easier. And then uh, so he's been editing stuff I've shot for almost like 14 years now. So and he knows he knows all the flaws and he knows how the flaws can actually be you know used interestingly. And also I have so much faith when the footage goes to him. So I always want him to edit anything I do, because yeah he'll look at all the because I shoot little things when no one's looking to, and that's like that's like the fun stuff and. Sometimes it can save a scene when the whole take is out of focus or something like that, when I really goofed. So he's like my best friend because he, he cuts all the, that stuff out, but then he also cuts like good stuff too, so I kind of hate him then. But, but yeah, no, he's like, and so it's, just, it's been the three of us now, it's like, yeah, we could do something very quickly, I think. And um, it's just subconscious. We, also, when I work with Alex, we don't really talk a whole lot. We don't describe shots you will make like a fast like movie reference or something and then that's like enough i know what he wants with a whole scene even you know i can tell like you know he'll just tell me this should be like this scene and that or whatever but they don't we don't we don't we don't want to imitate movies so we always like you know just change it a little bit or do something a little bit wrong yeah it's usually something we haven't seen in years like yeah. the movie we were just shooting i referenced a, a horror film that i really love called let's scare jessica to death and Sean's like, yeah, I haven't seen that in a really, really long time. And I was like, but you kind of remember what I'm talking about. And he was like, eh, maybe. And I was like, well, let's just think about it while we go into this next scene. We didn't look at it again or anything, though. So no, yeah, we don't want to. Not until after we can... shot the relevant scene did we look at what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. And it was exactly the same. I, I think, it, I mean, for me, editing's uh, often fixing problems. And in this case, you know, whenever I'm working with Sean's footage specifically, it's, it's always just you know, a wealth of, of, of possibilities. Um, and, and this film specifically, the, when I read the screenplay, I couldn't even believe it. Like, Alex, I always sort of considered like a friend that like, you know, we insult each other as much as possible. And, uh, and I just couldn't believe how mature and, and like, you know, real it was in every way. And to see then like a cast come together that was extraordinary, I just, it was almost unbelievable how you know, it's easy for me to say because I wasn't there shooting and holding a camera and, and having to go through some of the things, but this was just a remarkably easy process in, for me because it just happened so smoothly, like sort of like you had to pinch yourself occasionally and be like, and now we're here, which is my favorite movie theater in the world. And so it's, it's uh, you know, I mean, I think we just have a, the shorthand that Alex and I have developed very quickly, Sean and I have for a decade plus, and so that makes it all, you know, easier too. But in this case, I think it's also just a, you know, it comes from an amazing screenplay, which, you, I mean, people say things like, it's the best screenplay I've ever read. I, I usually, I mean, I can't imagine who's measuring screenplays. It's like the worst part of the process to me is reading a screenplay. In this case, I was like, oh my God, this is really something. And then the actors, I, I you know, it was, you know, I mean, I, especially, you know, the way Sean shot Jason, for instance, like, Jason's been in so many great movies, but 
being able to work with some of these images of, of an actor I love and the cinematographer I love, it was just, it was crazy. So, um, I don't know. Jason looks great with the beard. He does. Thank I hope you. he keeps it forever. Very handsome. Uh, you mentioned, Jason, that the, you and Alex looked at We Won't Grow Old Together. Um, did you, uh, were there other films that came up, uh, maybe with Sean and Robert, in terms of talking about the look and the rhythm of the film? Uh, yeah, I can just give like a quick bullet point list of other movies. So Jason and I watched uh, P.L. Oz, We Won't Grow Old Together, which when there was a new print of it a few years ago, I was like, Sean, are you going to go see that? And he was like, no, I, I, I see it up here. I don't need I've to go. I've seen it. I've seen it many times, though. No, you were like, I don't need to go see <laughs> I saw it. saw when I they did the series here no, the 10 point, years ago. The point was you didn't need to see it because it lives in, you, you've seen it and you've, it lives in your memory. Not that you live it in your life, but, well, maybe a little bit. And uh, so we watched We Won't Grow Old together, and Husbands and Wives was a major, major influence on this film. Sean and I looked, not at the whole movie, because that would, you know, be, then we'd just be ripping it off, but, like, the camera work in that film is from another universe. And the one thing we directly stole from it is there's a shot. It's I think like the fir one, in the first scene of that film, where like the camera lands behind a lamp and then kind of adjusts and whatever was going on at the time that that movie was being conceived, like it's just unbelievable the way that that energy was translated into the cinematography and the style of that. And then that was something that Robert looked at, but also that movie shot like a documentary, which Robert mostly makes and edits. So. That style was pretty organic to both sides of that process. And um, Jason and I watched Carnal Knowledge, which I'd never seen, which he said we should look at. And we, we borrowed one shot from it. <clears throat> um, and I don't know, I think, I mean, that's basically it. You know, like there's other New York movies. Like I watched uh, this movie called Heart with uh, Brad Davis, which is like a New York movie that just like looks like nothing. It's just so brown and anonymous and timeless. It's from, you know, right before he died, 86 maybe. I don't, and um, Rich Kids uh, is a film that I really like. It's like a shot on location New York movie, and uh, The Squid and the Whale is like another like brown Brooklyn movie. These were all sort of you know connected in some way, and the locations people got some of these references, and then the art direct the art director and production designer got some of these, and then Sean was given some. And you know. Hi mom, also right. And what? Hi mom. Hi, uh, greetings. Oh, the greetings. opening shot of this movie I wanted to be a reference to the opening shot of the Palmas Greetings, where it's just a guy walking down the street in New York. Um, I want to give Robert's film a plug too, which we are. Uh, Robert uh, made a film called Actress, which we are opening here at the Film Society. Enough about of that. Consent. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Remember, Robert uh, did direct and edit a movie that I had to listen to a lot about when we were editing last okay, year. Okay, we'll move on. We'll move on. Now we're going to open it up for questions. It's true. <laughs> That's uh, brilliant film. Thank you so much. Really. Perfect uh, question. Next. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just couldn't help thinking of Philip Roth, of course, through this film and. How much knowing about his life and career and everything? How much I know about his life? Or I mean, a lot. Influenced, yeah. His influence on me is 100%. Um, my last film, The Color Wheel, I, uh, is like a movie made by like a 24, 25-year-old who's discovering his work for the first time. And this is a movie made by like a 29-year-old who's read every word and has just ingested every single lesson and doesn't even, like we're talking about with films, don't even need to look back at them to feel... Uh, the weight of his influence and how brilliant and informative and poetic I find everything he's ever done. You know, I never picked up one of his books in the writing and making of this film, but it's just all in me now. Um, similar to the way that We Won't Grow Together is in Sean. And his, his life as well, did that uh, enter A huge fan of his life. Our, 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 um, our, the, a lot of people, like uh, Jonathan watched uh, the PBS documentary about him. And there's a part in this film uh, where Jonathan says, rub two sticks together and make fire, which is something that Roth says about the writing process in that documentary, which was his idea that he brought to set when he was kind of watching him. And uh, the costume designers watched that documentary as well. Uh, yeah, he's just a fascinating guy. I mean, I feel very connected to like any sort of East Coast, lifelong East Coast creators, because that's what I intend to, be. I mean, you know, I've only got 30 years on the East Coast so far, but I don't plan on going anywhere. And he's really, you know, major for me uh, for a lot, a lot of reasons that I, I could never possibly concisely explain. But I think this movie is as close of an explanation of what he means to me as anything could be. And it's still almost two hours long. Yes, um, I want to go back to the, the aesthetics of the cinematography and the, how that affects the storytelling. You, um, I mean, Sean's film, Heaven, it's a very long, he shot from way back. Uh, Sorry, what, what film? The, yeah, Heaven Knows What. Oh, yeah. yeah. And in, in this film, the, the choice of the, the, the intense consecutive close-ups, um, I wondered, in and, and 16 millimeter, 
Alex, why did you want that? And Sean, why did you want that? Um, I can answer briefly, and there's a part of this that involves the performance, but, you know, I mean, Husbands and Wives, again, is, you know, a very intimate and very shaky and very rough film, and I didn't want to copy that aesthetic because it's beautiful. I wanted to copy it because that's the anxiety of the claustrophobia of New York City that made me want to make this movie and the only acceptable style to capture what it is that Philip and Ashley are meant to be going through in this apartment, on these streets, in these spaces, is that. And you know, I just generally would like to see close-ups. I find them to be very interesting, and of course, a purely cinematic creation that you don't get in anything else. And you know, now that we finally have like actors in the movie that aren't just like my bozo friends or me, as in the case of my previous film, I really want to see those faces because they're incredibly expressive and really uh, capable of emoting in mi minor ways, and I don't want to miss it. And um, we shot this movie last September into October, and all of July there was a complete Cassavetes retrospective at BAM <clears throat> that I went to see. I, I didn't miss a day in it, and Sean joined for some of it. And you know, it just emboldened me to just go for it as much as possible because that you know level of proximity, 16 in some cases on his films, and then thinking of husbands and wives just made me feel really safe. So then we would sort of let the actors block the scenes out, just me and them. And then Sean would join the room as an additional really body in the room, a presence and a performer who would move, you know, like a magnet that like every time Jason would walk forward, Sean would walk backwards and et cetera, to just bring that energy um, and allow everybody to sort of dance around one another. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I always love shooting close-ups. I love faces and all. I think that when we did Color Wheel with Alex in it, I think I started to want to pull back. Um, <laughs> And so, we, yeah, so that one's not so intense because of that, I think, maybe partly. But this one, again, you know, it's, yeah, we have, like, nice faces and stuff, so we're going to shoot <laughs> close-ups. And, and we were in small rooms, usually, and I had, all, they're all telephoto lenses, though, in it, so that's why it's especially kind of agitated and all, because they are long lenses. I was always on an opposite wall or something, you know, like, against, I mean, as far away as I could be sometimes. It was partly a mistake, actually, in ordering the lenses. I thought I was getting something else, and, but they're all... There's no even normal or wide lenses in it, and um, so yeah, so, but, but I, I mean, yeah, I guess that's, I don't know, I guess that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, the, the heaven knows what was all long, longer lenses, obviously, and I was like a block away, I, I don't know, but it's actually not that different. They're still all telephoto. Um, yeah, I mean, that's to me, like, it's getting to the point where like, I, I feel a, a responsibility to sort of beat the drum of why we, we just shot our fourth movie on film. The first two were filmed. This, of course, Super 16. Um, like, I feel a responsibility to sort of be a mouthpiece for why I like it so much. But to me, it's still not even a choice. Like, to me, that's just the, what movies are made on. And it always has been, except for the last 10 years. So I still haven't quite adjusted to why another choice would be made. Um, I, I, you know, it's just beautiful. I love it. It's incredibly handsome format and uh, it's versatile. And you know, I, it, I don't have an answer because it's not even a decision. It's just the way to me I want to make movies. It's the way movies are made, and uh, hopefully it's the way that movies can continue to be made. And I think I've sort of proven, and hopefully I, you know, talk about this a lot so that anybody in a position to learn is listening. Like <clears throat> my first two movies, both were they were fifteen and twenty five thousand dollars, and they were shot on film. So there's really no like bottom of how cheap your movie can be if you still really want to shoot on film. It can be part of it. Uh, you know, I just love it more than anything. And Sean's very comfortable with it and loves it. And I don't know, actors seem to respond to it too. It makes everyone feel like you're doing something real. Like someone couldn't accidentally hit a button and delete all of your work. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your decision to set the, um, set the story in period. Uh, I found myself uh, trying to guess exactly sort of what year we were in and uh, wondered whether that affected the, the, the filmmaking choices uh, as you were going along, you know, blocking out automobiles or things like What'd that. What'd you come up with on your I, guess? Of uh, I would say the mid-1980s, mid-1980s. Right. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, you know, we didn't, I mean, there's no, we didn't block out cars, of course, like, you know, I mean, if it looks that way, then that's remarkable, but this wasn't that kind of movie. Uh, you know, Ike's car is clearly a fairly new Jaguar. Um, but like I said, you know, every film I just 
listed when Dennis asked about influences. The most recent one is Husbands and Wives, which is 1992. And that was just where every reference ended for every stitch of fabric that the actors wore, except for a little bit of what Ashley wears. Um, and every prop and every piece of furniture. Uh, you know, to me, it's just a beautiful, a beautiful era, and I still haven't conceived of a way that technology like a phone or a computer would logically fit into any sort of classical narrative. Because, again, like up until five years ago, nothing I ever saw or read involved any of these things. So my ideas are still fairly set. And as long as you're making that movie, you might as well just go for it. And if you don't need to have characters on phones, you might as well not have TVs or computers in their homes either just because it's beautiful and it sort of gives it a like people doing what you just said which is sitting there during the film and saying I wonder when this takes place like this is not an expensive enough movie that you really could have like cleared a street and moved all these cars and brought in 20 cars from the 80s but maybe you know that's a fun conversation to be having um, in your head while you're watching it and, you know it just sort of gives the film the timeless quality that all the references I just listed uh, certainly share. Plus, we never talked about a period or anything. It's just that modern technology is ugly. All the gadgets are ugly to look at. Um, they're not designed to, I mean, I don't know, it's just aesthetically uh, ugly and unwelcome in the frame. A new, a flat screen TV would be horrible to look at. A cell phone is ugly, everything's ugly. <laughs> That's new. Uh, my question is for you, Mr. Schwartzman. Um, now I'd say this is at least your third role playing a writer of uh, Jonathan Ames and uh, Jack Whitman in the past. Did you draw much from those past roles to construct kind of the anti, what I would say, I would say Philip is kind of the anti Jonathan Ames, not at all kind, eager to please and lovable. And kind of how, how do you feel now playing so many writers? Well. Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't think too too much about it in terms of those characters. Um, uh, also, because gosh, I'm so sorry. Uh, you know, in 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 both of those uh, roles, those guys are struggling to write, and I think it's interesting. Uh, in this movie, we never see him suffering from any type of writer's block, and you know, I, this is the kind of writer that those guys would have been really jealous of. Um, and in fact, there's one line in the movie where he says, I'm filling up notebooks with nothing but junk. So the idea... I thought his nickname uh, should be Philip Notebooks. Philip <laughs> Notebooks. Yep, that's the best. <laughs> Can't beat that alias. That's the best. Um, I, Get it? Philip Notebooks. Yeah, Philip. Yeah. Um, but, um, but, uh, so, I, so I didn't think about it in terms of that, but, uh, um, what was the rest of the I question? guess, well... Then how does it? Do you do you seem to just agree more with the role of a writer? Well, no. I mean, honestly, Alex said something to me early on that was so um, funny, and whether or not it was completely true, I, but I, I said, well, it's about a writer, and he said, it's not about a writer, it's about an asshole, <laughs> uh, and uh, and he's a writer, and it, it, the fact that he just decided to put it after. That be, it's, that's a completely strange way to look at it. And I, I think that was really, really interesting. And, um, but of course, yeah, he's a, he's a writer and he's someone who um, is, uh, has probably dreamed of what he wanted his life to be like when he was very young. Probably said, I'm gonna move to New York, I'm gonna become a novelist. I might or might not be lonely. And that's just gonna be the price that I pay. And, that's why a lot of the narration um, is so nice, and it was so nice that Alex did it on set, because um, I was asked if that, if that was uh, th threw the actors off when, to have Alex reading, but it didn't throw me off, because in fact, I think that's probably what Philip would have loved, just a narrator, like just narrating things, <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and uh, out loud. And um, so, so that was, uh, yeah, that was important. And, um, but I don't know about a, a writer, per se. It's just, uh, it was just a great character I, who I, I loved. See our final question? Hi. Um, I was wondering um, if you can tell us about uh, casting process. And uh, additional question was, you guys were talking about Kim's video, <laughs> working at the Kim's video. What kind of clerks were you? That's good, because then we can just move down and everyone can say something for the final one. Um, about working at Kim's, what kind of clerks we were. Ah. So we'll skip you two for that part, and we'll just go right to Sean and Robert. 
Um, the casting process for me was really, I mean, it was interesting because my previous two films were, every, you know, I would be writing it and I would have to email someone and say, I'm going to shoot a movie, you know, in June, can you be in it? Okay, good, now I'll write you in. And this I wrote without thinking about that. And um, we had two sets of producers on this film. One was a company called Sailor Bear who had produced a film called Ain't Them Body Saints. And the other was a company based downtown called Washington Square, which produced um, movies like um, Old Joy, and uh, last year they had All, All Is Lost uh, here at the festival as well. And um, because Sailor Bear had, you know, just had Ain't Them Body Saints at Sundance, we were able to get the script through them into the Hollywood system, which I had no knowledge of how it worked. And I basically ended up in a room. A bear dressed as a sailor came to my house and handed me the script. <laughs> that's so weird. I didn't know that. No, that's how that's there. That's, that's their that, niche. That's where that name is. It's like a... a like a bear, a bear yeah. um, and it's just that clearly just blew Jason's mind, and he said he'll do anything with this bear. Um, yeah. okay. No, it was really interesting for me to be in a room, having you know I was in LA because um, Color Wheel, which is like the smallest, scrappiest, most like ridiculous movie, was nominated for a Spirit Award, and while I was there, I went into an agency and sat down with like heads of talent, and they were like, which of our clients should we send your script to? And I was like, well, this is a joke. Like, you, you won't send it to him, will you? And they were like, yeah, we'll send it to anybody. And I was like, what about him? And they were like, anybody. And I was like, yeah, but him? And they were like, no, seriously. Like, and I was like, well, Jason Schwartz, a guy like Jason Schwartz would never do a movie like this. And they were like, why not? And I was like, because this is like a small movie. And they were like, who says it's small? You say it's small. And I was like, oh, I guess so. And I was, this was like someone who's like a failing student being like, you should apply to Harvard. Like, You'll probably get it. It was like you, and I was like, oh, sure, yeah, send it. <laughs> I guess so. That's like, so, crazy. so I, so I was like, you know, I was like, wow, like, uh, so yeah, you can send this script to Jason Schwartzman, Elizabeth Moss, and they were like, yeah, yeah, I can send it to anybody, and I was like, well, these are exactly who I would want in the movie, and it was just very organic. I mean, it was just like the old way of like telling an agent I like their client a lot, and their client is exactly who I want, and then that was February. We met in April, and Jason was in New York um, for a movie at Tribeca. And, you know, he said yes. And then after he was involved, people would read the script and they would know what kind of film we were definitely going to be making once they could picture it. And in fact, very soon after, people were like, so you must have written this for Jason or with him, right? And I was like, no, I, can't, I still can't believe he's in it. <laughs> um, but, you know, I just got very lucky. And then we just sort of built it one by one. And then the one mysterious role was I was like, we like getting a, a, a French actress was really hard because that's not like... There's just not, like, in the Hollywood agency system, that's not, like, a well-represented, uh, you know, they're not, like, yeah, we have all these, you know, actresses that we're always, like, sending out that are, like, you know, European and evocative of a certain type of cinema. And actually, I went to college, NYU, with Josephine's agent, and she was in New York for a wedding, and I was just talking to her, and I was like, good, our movie is four-fifths cast with our five main characters. We just are missing one, like, a, a young French woman. And she was like, oh, I represent someone. You should meet her. And then we just met the same way I just met everybody. Like, they just read the script and then I met with them. and It was really pleasant. I don't know, it really exposed me to the fact that actors will be like, you know, you wouldn't be talking to an actor to come make a film like this if they weren't ready to come make your kind of movie. Which I say again in relationship to like making movies with friends of mine who I worked at a video store with. Like, you're not gonna find someone who's like sort of interested, kind of reluctant to meet, agrees to do it, thinks it might, like if they are coming to make a small movie it's for passion, and that was really humbling to learn that actors of this caliber would actually put enough faith in guys like us who like, so, the, so they sent my last movie, The Color Wheel, with the script, which is like a black and white grainy movie about sibling incest, and literally every actor in this movie watched that movie and still said yes, which just like, <laughs> like when we found out that Jonathan Price like sat down and watched Color Wheel, which he did not reveal to us until the end of the shoot, you know, we were like, wow, I can't believe you came to do this movie. He's like, well, I watched your last movie and I knew I certainly couldn't do a worse job than you did in that, so. <laughs> um, it's just crazy that people would look at that movie, which is very scrappy and, you know, certainly I guess has its charm in some ways, but the actors are all game and that's really humbling for people like me and Sean and Robert to be able to learn that we can make our kind of movies with, you know, the exact type of talent that you would never think you would even be able to have a conversation with. You know, just to to go to the Kim's video question because it's slightly related in a really self, tr truly self-deprecating way, but it's the truth that I'd never thought of until just now. Uh, I had been into Kim's a few times, but always felt too intimidated 
and left uh, because I swear to, I'm, I swear because I was afraid that I would pick something stupid and so because I thought they were all so great and smart and such impeccable taste and how wrong you were it, it, well but in a, in a just a I don't know t t as the dance partner to your answer uh, I was excited that you guys would want to work with me so it's crazy I mean crazy what a weird <laughs> sentence to hear from like <laughs> um, oh, it's true I, I was like yeah. Oh, so, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, the casting was very organic, and you know, like every the important thing I learned about making any film, I learned this on Color Wheel, and in this movie, I was just blown away. It's just everybody has to be making the same movie, and when you're bringing in diverse actors from different backgrounds, and Jonathan had just done King Lear in London, and uh, you know, Lizzie was on hiatus from Mad Men before the final season, and like everyone's coming from different pursuits and. Everyone just has to be making the same movie, and I think like we just ended up with such a lucky ensemble because everybody in the cast was making the same movie, and that was the movie that we sort of dreamt of before we even knew who could be in it. Um, and as for what kind of clerks, uh, you know, I was real, I was pretty friendly unless customers got out of line. Um, you know, by I, asking a question or uh, asking for help, you mean what's that? out of line? Yeah, I mean, what kind of clerk were you, were, were you, Sean? I was a nice guy. Sean, Sean would sit in the corner. There's customers here. Yeah, that, and um, talk very for customer, customers call, here. They could tell you. Sean would sit in the corner and not do any work and just bring... Well, he'd be putting in movies, but it would take him all day, and he'd just have a parade of people come to talk to him about movies while the rest of us were actually doing work. And, you know, it, like, that just happened all the time. It would just be... He posted right. up, not moving, all day while other people were doing work. And one time I gave Liv Tyler, mo the mother and the whore... And that was cool. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We, we all we were, we were all nice there. I mean, I yeah. Was there was anyway. this thing about there was this thing about Kim's being assholes and intimidating jerks, which I think like maybe that was Nick Pinkerton downtown or something. Um, uh, but we were we were actually we I I thought we were like no we're not like that. We we had a couple jerks. We had actually people would come in and be like, hey, this is where you can be assholes to people, right? That's cool. And it's like well. We're, we're nicer up my, here. My feeling wasn't based customers. on reputation. My feeling was just based on you guys are <laughs> had it going on. I mean, you guys <laughs> even I, even I would absurd. never buy like a Jimi Hendrix CD downstairs. I would go to Virgin Megastore to do that. Yeah. I mean, right. come on. You have, to, even you, when I you have to keep in mind that like any business thing. on St. Mark's is going to bring in the craziest, weirdest was. customers. And it's just easy to get mad at those people. But they're not like civilized people who like live in the real world. They're people who like... You know, are still awake at 10:30 in the morning and come in to like hang out for three hours and just like ruin the entire store. For uh, people. Uh, off of memory, did anyone ever bring in anything that was the ultimate treasure for you that still stands out as I can't believe I'm holding this in my hand and this person's considering selling it to, to oh, us? Oh no, I mean DVDs Alex isn't a collector. <laughs> huh? He's not a collector. Me? Yeah. Yeah, really. I mean like you know, DVDs were went through a period where they were really scarce. Like some DVDs were worth hundreds of dollars and. But that still wasn't that much. Even just a bootleg of something, I mean, any type of. Well, I don't know. I mean, we Sean and Robert bootlegs. worked on a different floor than I did. <laughs> well, we had Sa Satan Tango, and you had to give uh, just like 12 hour Bellatar film, and you had to give like $150 to be able to rent it because it was completely legal. And then people would get really, really angry that they would have to give $150 to us. And that was always a hilarious thing. Like, you, you, like they were angry that they'd have to give for, for 12 tapes or 8 tapes or whatever it was. That was, you know, it's that only, was it's only eight hours long. Couldn't yeah, even. It was. It seemed like twelve hours. All right. Maybe we should have you all back to do a panel on Kim's yeah. video at some point. But uh, thank you. <laughs> thank very you all much. so much. Uh, congrats thank you guys so much. Thank I you. appreciate it.